guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are doing monthly webinars for all you amazing people. Uh, we typically start right on the hour. I am today in my Edmonton office. Um, unfortunately, the boardroom that I booked, I don't think I finished clicking all the links. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, so here I am. I'm actually literally like in a closet. <laughs> it's a little phone booth. Uh, so it's like very like stark background today, but that's okay because we're not here to enjoy the pretty background and even then uh, what would you see if you were in Edmonton I don't know maybe some snow maybe some cars driving by this gives us the attention of each other but we're not here about backgrounds and about what I'm here to just talk to you about the wonderful places that I travel to but rather the content today we are focusing on how to respond when you get the question what's my ROI, what's my return on investment, and why so many people get it wrong. Because it doesn't matter what type of business you're in, you're going to get the ROI question. Uh, we have a small group here today, so I love to engage with you guys. Uh, go ahead, open up the chat. Let me know a little bit about you know where you are, what kind of company you have, um, and even what you're hoping to learn out of today's session. I, as much as possible, try to make this as um, interactive as possible to a certain degree. All of you guys have your videos off, so that is fantastic. But at the same time, the more I know about each one of the people that are in the room, the easier it is for me to ultimately help you um, have better conversations, be able to connect with your clients even deeper. The chat will be open throughout the entire conversation. So feel free to keep it open because I'm going to have a few stopping points where I do want to hear back from you. I do want to hear what it is about your business or how you're applying this or what kinds of questions that you have. I typically do reserve time um, at the very end for questions, but feel free to ask any questions as we go along. If I can answer it really quickly, I will. If it is something that I feel uh, requires a more in-depth uh, answer or something that I feel is just a little bit too specific to a certain business or industry, uh, I will ask that we reserve that question for the very end and then I will respond to it. But don't let that stop you from asking questions, commenting in the chat. Welcome Shannon, Michael, Matthew, Linda, Linda, Charles, Anne Marie, and myself. I am so glad to have you guys each and everyone here. Go ahead. Don't forget to tell me where you're calling or where you're, you're connecting to from, uh, what kind of business you have and why answering this question was so important for you. So let's get started. For those of you that um, already know, you're more than welcome to just kind of like, you know, set, turn yourselves off for a little while. But I love to tell you guys about our humble beginnings and how far we come. So KO Advantage Group is my company. We are currently at a team of six. Ah, this is amazing. So six people, we, we've grown, we've expanded, we've shrank. I mean, the, the enjoyments of all small businesses. But right now, we are one of the fastest growing sales training companies between Canada and the US. Like, how ridiculous is that? So we train people in this format. So if you enjoy this format, um, and I promise you it get, does get a little bit more interactive because I actually do require you to have your videos on. We go through the materials. Um, it's not so much of a one-way conversation, but rather a collaboration. That's one of the reasons why we're able to expand right across the, the board. Um, the biggest thing is that we focus on consultative B2B service-based companies. So if co consultations or consultative services or really understanding your client is really important to you, this is what you need. And we don't just teach it, but we teach you how to capture that premium dollar for your premium solution. How do you, all else being equal, why would someone choose your company over someone else's? You guys, I'm already starting to see a lot of conversation in the chat. Don't forget to put me, put in the meantime, where you are calling from, what kind of business you have, um, what you wanna get out of today's webinar. So I can address that when we're getting to our stopping point. My personal sales background though, I, uh, I actually worked in sales for a long time. They, they say those that can do and those that can't teach, I promise I did both. I was both successful uh, with my very first sales career, Xerox. And the one thing I took away from Xerox more than anything else is that sales is a process. 
follow the process boom, 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 and you will always get the results. Like anything, if you follow every, all the instructions, you know, whether that is putting together an Ikea shelving or going ahead and baking a cake, you need to follow the instructions. And as long as you follow the entire process, you're not trying to throw in a baking pan before you've mixed in all the ingredients. You're not going ahead and trying to stand up the shelf before you put in all the, the screws and widgets it will work. It will work every single time. So the one thing I learned from that was that sales is a process. And number two, you follow the process and it doesn't matter what you're selling, whether you're selling Xerox, American Express, Purolite, or Clarion Medical Systems. At the end of the day, what you'll notice with all of those logos on the right-hand side is that each one of those companies is considered to be the top price in their market. They exist because they are a premium service, not in, in the exchange of, I was at a, on a panel and there was one person on the panel with me who was saying, oh, if you're the top price, people are gonna sm smash you away. And I'm like, no, I'm like, I wish upon every one of you, all of you in the room, that you guys are the top price and you're able to capture the business that you absolutely wanted to. This is me today. So I am, um, I'm the woman on the left, um, in case you, you don't know. Um, that is my, my best friend, Oprah. I don't know if she knows that, but it's definitely true for me. Uh, I am also LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow, Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger. That's my third book, you guys. Sell more faster. I'm gonna actually, I usually reserve it for the, the end, but if you haven't downloaded it yet, um, I'm gonna give you guys the link right now to actually download the entire book for free uh, sell more faster book so there's the link you guys just go to that and it will give you the entire PDF entirely for free so you don't even have to worry if you do want to buy it I, I'm like graciously will accept that um, but for most of you right you some of you guys like e-readers or whatever and go ahead do that okay so let's uh, let me just see what you got so far going on here you guys thank you so much oops I want to hear, so before I go into a little bit more stories about me, I want to hear about you. So we have Shannon from Calgary. She does management consulting. Oh, wonderful, Shannon. Charles from Toronto. His business is in leadership and team development. Oh my goodness. And the, what do I get for my return on my investment? Okay, Charles, I feel you because I train, I, I train sales, right? How do we know we're getting our return on investment? If we're going to invest in you, how do we know we're going to get it back, right? We're going to have a great conversation today. Uh, Michael in Calgary, he's providing like automated environment environmental data. Oh my goodness, Michael, you get the return on investment all the time, right? You know, especially they use this, they're reluctant to talk about internal economics. So when we're, you, you're, the speeds and feeds conversation is going to resonate with you, Michael. I promise you, and we're going to show you how to get that uh, change the game all the way through. Anne-Marie in Edmonton. Welcome, Anne-Marie. I'm in Edmonton today too. I think you're in my calendar later on this afternoon, but event management and sponsorship. Oh my goodness, sponsors love it, right? What do I get for my money, right? I'm going to give you all this money. What do I get, right? Matthew um, for Portland, Maine. Welcome, Matthew, right? Uh, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm a huge, huge lover. I like, um, I, I, I apologize, but I don't apologize, right, to anyone who's on my Twitter feed, right? I am like, hashtag Iowa caucus all day today. So <laughs> I'm following along. I love it. Um, this, this for me, this is my playoff season. So uh, I enjoy all of the information that's going through. But small business process information and workflow. Welcome, welcome. And then finally, we have Linda in Winnipeg, who's accounting outsourcing. Oh, you guys, you uh, like your, my heart feels to you because I know what the pain is. When you get that question, you feel like you're, you're moving forward, you're moving forward, and you're getting all these people that are, you know, you're trying to push, you know, your solution through. And you're like, okay, but what am I getting for this? So I'm going to give you an example on why your typical uh, conversation doesn't work. So in the last slide, I showed you a bunch of logos on companies I had worked for. And when I worked for Xerox, right, my very first corporate sales position, we would do something called speeds and feeds. And the idea was how fast does the paper come in? How fast does the paper go out? And Xerox was constantly improving this. We were making faster copiers, faster printers. With the idea of that being is the faster that we, the faster that we can go ahead and produce the paper in, put paper out, this leads to time savings. Well, I mean, what do we know, right? Time is 
money, right? Time is money, right? If you can save someone time, they can easily make more money. And so we would say, okay, well, now that we've saved you all this time, because you're going from like, let's say a 10, uh, 10 page per minute copier to a 50 page per minute copier. Wow. Think of all the time you're saving, right? That should easily translate into money. And so if we just go with the assumption that time is money, we would say, okay, well, listen, you know, just by getting a faster copier, more money means a bigger return on investment. And we, when I worked for Xerox, we brought in the this, um, this gentleman who was considered to be like the ironclad business case solutions guy. And he would go in and he would show us exactly how to now quantify this, like even further. And he's like, don't just tell the client that, you know, faster copiers would lead to money, show them how much money. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you're absolutely right. I need to show my clients how much money they would ultimately make because they're using a faster copier. And so we would go ahead and now we would take the difference, the difference between the copier that they were using and the copier that they're going to get, right? So now we have like, you know, some type of quantifiable in how much time we would save. And then we would multiply by usually some arbitrary or hourly wage, right? Well, it's somebody, if you had like a receptionist or you had like an administrator doing this type of task, how much time would they save? Times up by their hourly wage or some type of, you know, amount of their salary, which now gives them something a little bit harder, right? You know, yeah, it's still soft costs, but now we can actually quantify them and we're, we're showing them exactly the amount of money that they're ultimately saving. This was revolutionary from our perspective, from the salesperson's perspective. Because the one thing the client didn't buy into was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I get that. So I know you're going to save me time, but like, what am I supposed to do? Like, just like, like fire Karen now? <laughs> and we're like, ah, like you can't be going ahead and recommending a company to fire someone. I mean, we could, right? We're kind of going down that road, but is that really the right recommendation that we want? And so this left to big fails because how do you tell a company that number one, they are over hiring or over or paying more for staff than they absolutely had to, unless you're coming in and completely automating it. But we'll talk about um, like areas on that, on how we can quantify that, but we'll get really clear on that. But we couldn't do this because why, why did this suck? Because if we saved Karen, let's say two hours, four hours of time, they weren't going to dismiss her. They weren't going to send her home early. They still had a bunch of hours to do. Where we missed was the connection point between the time we saved and what it could ultimately do for her business, right? So there's two big fails on this, but we'll talk about each one of these as we go through them. So I think the first question right now is though, when does that ROI question come up. And I want you guys to write in the chat, like when do you think it would typically come up in a sales cycle? If you understood your sales cycle, or even if you don't really know, when does that ROI question come up? Because how do we know how to address it if we're not clear on where it is in the sales cycle? So I'm gonna give you guys a second. You guys are all very quiet today. So I'm making sure that you guys are participating too, because I don't wanna be the one doing all the work on this beautiful Monday morning. Okay. I got, I got two in privately. I don't know why you guys did privately, but you know, this is, so one person said the proposal stage, right? You know, usually when you're going to propose, right? When you're going to close the deal, does the client go, actually both of you guys said the proposal stage. So let's talk about this, you guys, because timing is everything. Sometimes never. Oh, Charles, you're so lucky if you never get it. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you might not get it, but we're going to talk about this, you guys. Timing is everything. Michael Rowan says the first meeting. You know what, Michael? I'm so glad you said that because on Friday, um, oh, we might not ever get that far. Oh, good question, Charles. Okay, so let's we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. But Michael, the first meeting, I'm glad you mentioned this because on Friday, I had somebody come up to me and said, Kim, hey, we've been watching your content and everything. We'd love to have a conversation with you about potentially sales training our team. And I said, awesome, let's get on the phone. So we get on the phone. And as we're, we're having this great conversation and everything, and as we're just about to get off the phone, the person says, mm hmm he's like, so uh, why should we do business with you versus someone else? 
<laughs> so this actually brings me to this slide, right? We just timing is everything because you guys, first of all, sometimes we get the return on investment question and we actually don't even really know what's the return on investment question, right? Why should we do business with you? Why should we, why should we invest in your company, Charles, versus someone else, right? Uh, what will you provide us versus going somewhere else completely? What do I get? Right. What do I get? Might be, you know, a question that we have. These are return on investment questions, even though the client hasn't said ROI. Right. They're just trying to understand if I'm going to spend a dollar with you, how is that dollar going to translate into more dollars? Um, and Matthew says, yeah, his, his questions don't usually touch on that directly. Right. It's a hint and it's through the discovery phase. Bang on, Matthew, right? We're going to talk about that too. But listen, you guys, when we do get the question, right? And it could happen in the first meeting. It could happen even on the first phone call, right? It could happen throughout the entire thing. When a question, when that question starts to come up, it number one says the client is interested. They just want to know where you stand, right? But number two, depending on, and it even actually it doesn't even depend on where we are. Do we even have enough information to be able to answer this? Do we actually know what our clients want? So the response might change, but really only slightly. Because when we get those types of questions, well, why would I do business with you? Or what will I get? Our number one goal, you guys, get the meeting, right? Get the next meeting. It is not to be ambiguous in the conversation, but rather be like, you know what? That is a great question. We we probably we need to spend more time discovering what you will get with that, right? That's a great question. I would love to understand a little bit more about how this would impact your business. This isn't about us trying to answer it for them. And if I don't drill this in your head right now, I'm going to drill this in your head, like throughout the entire webinar so that you're like, oh my goodness, this is revolutionary. But you need to get to the next meeting. We cannot move forward until we absolutely get this. Because our clients, right, as lovely as our clients are, they always like to say, listen, I'm unique, I'm different, I'm individual, right? That works for all those different companies under all those different other conditions, but I'm completely different. I'm, I'm unique, we're a different type of company, we're a different type of program. And then also the client will typically say, I, I will know what to expect because everyone else has the exact same results as what I want, right? Just tell me what everyone else has gotten, how you've measured their return on investment, what they've received in terms of quantifiables. And then I will tell you if it will work for my business. So where do we choose? Do we choose that our clients are unique and individual and different? Or do we choose that our clients are exactly the same as everyone else? And their outcome is going to be exactly the same as everyone else. What do you guys think, right? Like, you know, where do we think we need to be? Because this is a big problem, right? If, if we, if, if, if we're go ahead and we try to give a response on what everyone else, and this is where people fall into traps because then we start to deliver them case studies. We start to deliver them testimonials. We, you know, Oh, well, can I just talk to some ref referrals, right? Will typically be one. Well, can I just talk to some references? <gasps> you guys like stop, right? If, if a client case studies and testimonials, whatever it's out there, right? Like that's fine. But if somebody starts to ask you for referrals and they're not already decided that they're ready to move forward with you, what are they hoping to hear from somebody, right? And the other thing is, is, you know, when we go through our entire sales cycle, we actually look at this as even more like a lead qualification stage, right? How will you know what you're going to be able to help them through? The biggest thing to take away, you guys, is that anything said to the client is up for skepticism, but anything the client says to us, is truth. If you tell a client what you think their, their return on investment is, what other companies have done in the past, well, how you've been able to quantify other results, they're going to look at you and they're like, mm hmm. Yeah. Well, it's not really going to work for us because we're unique. We're individual. We're different. That worked for that particular company under those particular economic situations. And they have a completely different clientele base than we do because we're completely different. So then if you're trying to pigeonhole them, you're putting that square peg in the round hole, how are you going to get it? So instead of trying to tell our clients what the return on investment is, we need to start asking them. We need to start understanding what their truth is. How will we end up figuring this out? So you need to expect, and I put this in quotes, the unexpected. Like if, can we really unexpect that a client's never going to ask us like, what's my return on investment? What am I going to get from there? Because throughout the entire buying cycle, the client is ultimately going through and asking themselves, if I invest 
this dollar. How will this dollar translate into more dollars for me? Now, what we don't know is what will they do with any type of investment? Yes, I'm going to go in and we're going to be able to help them, right? Yes, we're going to be able to develop them. And if you guys were a part of our webinar, I think it was last week, or last month or the month before, we talked about creating um, better openers and elevator pitches, right? How do you, uh, what does a client ultimately allow you to do, right? When you're working with them, what do they ultimately get from them? It is unlikely that the question is going to come up or, or sorry, it's highly likely that the question is going to come up at some point. And even in Charles's case, like where he's like, well, I don't know if I even really get that far, right? They probably asked it in some other way. Or the other thing is, is that we've ended up talking to them so much about what we expect them to get out of as a, as a result that they kind of decided, oh, I don't really know if that's the right result for me. I don't know if that's exactly what we want to do ambiguity is your friends you guys like don't feel like you need to divulge all the information you don't need to tell everybody exactly what everyone else has gotten in the past and you need to save the steps in the sales cycle for later on in the sales cycle um, how many of you guys just with a quick yes or no um, do demos as a part of your of your sales cycle demos um, Anne Marie says no Okay, I don't want to touch on demos too much. Michael does, yes. So Michael gets, no, 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 no. Okay, so for, for Michael, and if there's anyone else who hasn't answered yet, um, the yes, okay, you guys, demos, demos are terrible, right? And even as a buying perspective, um, and I don't want to say demos are terrible all the way across the board, but too many people put the demo phase too early into their sales cycle, right? They're like, well, let me show you my product. Let me show you my software. Um, you know, Charles is sending them videos, right? Let me send you a bunch of videos on, on how this can ultimately go. It's too early in the sales cycle because now we're asking the client, here's a bunch of information. You go through it and determine what sticks with you. <sighs> so wrong. We need to still gather in what the value is going to be for them. So the, the biggest thing here, you guys, is that are you preparing to answer what the return on investment is? Is this where you're spending all your time? Are you asking yourself, how do I quantify the return on investment? How do I go ahead and show them that there's more? And we're gathering information on how we're going to answer somebody's the question when the question comes up. Or are we preparing to ask them how they will measure this level of success? The nice thing is, is the faster you turn this around on them, the faster you maintain control of the entire sales cycle and the entire conversation. When we bring up, usually that what is my return on investment is sometimes also considered an objection and it usually fits in the objection phase of the, the sales cycle. Typically objections happen right around the value creation and the proposal stage where the client is ultimately asking, well, how will I know that you're the person that I want to go with, right? Can I, can I trust you if we move forward on this? Can I, will I know that I'm going to get something back in return? Where when we bring up any type of objection first, right? Well, you know, I want you to be clear, our solution doesn't work for this type of company. And we definitely can't work with um, companies in this geography. We, we are just not suited to work with this type of industry, right? You know, when you bring up those types of objections first, even, where it's like, listen, like, you know, how will we measure the success of your, of your investment? Now it makes you appear more trustworthy than if you're trying to push forward into the next meeting. You guys, I want to be clear. You may lose some meetings out of this phase, but you're also going to gain some meetings. The ones that you lose when you ask them these questions, they were never yours to begin with because it is not up to you to tell your clients the questions all the thing. Um, Anne-Marie asks, in order for me to answer this, I need to understand their objectives. Um, once, I understand, uh, once I understand that I'm in better position to answer, is that the right way? Yeah, I mean, if you guys, so if you've watched some of my other trainings, one of the biggest things I say is like, right in the lead qualification is like, we ask them typically, what is your goal, right? What do you want to achieve out of this, right? Um, we're gonna take it a few steps further, specifically in the return on investment, but we need, to, we need to understand that. So a few of you guys told me when you think that the return on investment question comes up from the client's perspective. So knowing now that we need to be in front of it, we need to be the ones that are ultimately bringing up. When should 
we be at, um, asking the return on uh, the return on investment question? When do you think it should come up in the sales cycle? I have such a small room and you guys are all so quiet. I'm like, <laughs> did you guys all party too hard yesterday for Super Bowl? Is this what's going on? <laughs> right away establishing that after determining their objectives okay okay like okay thank you guys like thank you charles thank you matthew shannon who's the first call yeah so i mean maybe the first call the first call might be a little bit too early to find out um what what we're how they're going to value this investment um but it is fair to ask them what they're hoping to achieve out of working with us right or what are their what are their ultimate goals now i am a big believer in taking it um the timeline much further than your typical timeline so in the sales cycle and this is the sales cycle that we use in our program um, so, I mean, you know, when you're typically in the first phone call, you're in that suspect or prospect range, right? Whether you know, you've reached out to somebody and you're having a conversation or they've reached into you and they said, we want to learn more. Can you tell us more? Now, to talk about return on investment may not be the right thing because it's like, well, listen, I'm happy to work with you. But like, you know, um, how much money are you hoping to make from, from this investment? It might come across as a little bit too brash. Lead qualification, it could be, and what you'll notice is in lead qualification is on top of the questions that we typically ask in the lead qualification phase, we also want to know what is their goal. But rather, where I like to use that return on investment question is in the value creation stage. The value creation stage, and I'm gonna, I'll come back to this here in a second. Some people will say, well, typically in the proposal, we present the return on investment at the proposal stage. But what you notice in the proposal stage is that number one, there should be an intention to buy. Nothing new should be presented. And we should feel about eight, a greater than 80% certain that the client is going to say it. Nothing new should be presented, you guys, at the proposal stage. And if we're now proposing and showing the client what the return on investment is, there's too much information here. There's too much new information. So we need to have the conversation at the value creation stage. That is when it's your responsibility to bring it up. You are in control of your own sales cycle. You are in control of the revenue that will eventually come from here. It is up to you to help the client get to that solution. Because remember, our clients are unique and individual and different. And we could tell them what others have seen in the past, but it doesn't mean that they think that they're going to get the same thing. It is your responsibility to be much more of a guide to with them as opposed to this is exactly how it is. Um, Matthew puts in there, I've asked people how they want to measure the return and I've gotten blank. So you're so close, Matthew, right? You're so close. I'm going to give you some more hints on how to, how to actually take that in there because yes, you're absolutely right. Great job in asking, right? By asking them specifically on how they want to measure the return on investment, right? Or their ROI. Yeah, they might get some, a blank stares, but that's also a good place to be. Okay. That's a good place to be because if they don't know, how are you supposed to know? If they can't tell you how, how they're going to measure the success of this, how are you supposed to know? Um, I was working with one client, um, or she was a prospect, really. And we, we were playing like this dance for a little while, right? We're having a meeting. And I'm a big believer. If you guys watch my content, I'm like, just get the next meeting, get the next meeting, get the next meeting, right? And so we, we go ahead and we meet and we meet again and we meet again. And, you know, and all of a sudden, like things are starting to get like a little bit weird, right? Because she's like asking me for a bunch of testimonials and like, you know, referrals and everything. And I said, I'm more than happy to give that to you. But I'm like, because we're in value creation phase, right? Propos uh, to, uh, referrals and everything should be close to, left closer to proposal stage. Stage. And so we're in value creation phase. And I said, listen, I just need to know, like, how will we measure your, like, how will we measure your success? How will we know you've achieved that? And she's like, well, that's up to you to tell me. And I said, I can't tell you what you find valuable. It is up to you to tell me. Now, uh, in this case, I had to leave that sales cycle, right? I just like, I mean, we got to a point where I'm like, listen, like there is literally nothing more for us to talk about because if you're expecting me to tell you what your response is or, or what, what you're expecting to get, I can't guarantee your result, right? But if you tell me what you want to achieve, I can help you get there. So what not to do? Oh, my picture is gone. Oh no. Oh, there it is. 
Um, what not to do. Okay, you guys, first thing is to stop throwing out facts and figures, especially without personal context, right? You can't just say, well, here's what, uh, what this company has achieved, right? So, you know, for example, uh, we've been able to save, you know, business owners just like you $30,000 in uh, streamlining this particular process. We've been able, uh, I would expect by, you know, moving everything towards this application or using us as one of your outsourced partners, you could potentially save yourself like 20 hours a week when you're applying this project. Okay, fair enough, right? But then how does that particularly apply to me as the client, right? It, you know, so we need to make sure that we are, if we're going to use facts and figures, how do we take this in and be able to turn it back on them? So we want to give them, if we do give facts and figures, right? Well, this is what the industry average has said, right? This is how much I would expect you to get. We used to do this in, um, when I worked for American Express, we would typically, and especially when you're getting into the very beginning stages, right? We throw, we throw things out. Okay. Hopefully this will stick. And we would do things like, um, you know, save 10% of your entire offering spend, right? As a catch, as a hook to get the client in. And when the client would hear that, I mean, they would typically come back to us. Now, did they ever hold our feet to the fire on that? No, because we didn't know enough about them. The goal was at that point to just get the meeting. Is this, is this enticing enough for you to want to meet with us? If it is, great, giddy up, let's go ahead and have a meeting. And then we can figure that out. If I continued on the sales cycle and said, listen, we're still going to be able to save you 10% of your operating spend without actually digging in deeper or what, how they would actually spend it. What if it wasn't operating spend? What if we would save um, 10% of maybe their tax bill? Maybe we would say, maybe we didn't even save money. Maybe they were actually wanting to invest their growing company. We want to invest. We want to spend more, right? And yet I'm pushing out this whole save, save, save. I'm doing myself a disservice. Remember, anything you tell the client is up for skepticism. Anything the client tells you is up for, um, is, their, is their own truth. We need to find out the information for them. So the other thing people do is they tell and they don't ask, right? This is exactly what you need to do, game over, right? Versus saying, okay, how do we take this in? Now, no one ever wants to hear what you think I should, you should do with my investment, right? Well, Kim, when you save 20%, this is what you could possibly do, right? When you go ahead and invest this money, this is exactly what you're going to do. Nobody wants to hear this, right? Um, if you have a spouse, right? There's a perfect example of this. My husband forever could tell me all the things that I should do, right? Well, you know, you should, um, you know, maybe write another book, Kim, you should go ahead and hire another employee. You should, you should, you should. And every time I hear him, I cringe, right? I mean, he's a, a brilliant person. He's amazing. And at the same time, I'm like, I don't want you to tell me what I should do, right? I don't know what, like, I don't want to hear what I should do with my company or with my business. Our clients are no different. They don't want to be should to death, right? Well, well, you should be able to save 20% and then you should be able to reinvest that. Oh, you should be able to uh, redeploy resources. You should be able to reduce your headcount. Okay, right, but you haven't asked me the question. So it's not up to you to tell the client what the return on investment is. It is up to you to ask the questions. If you get to that return on investment stage at the proposal and none of it is personally applicable to the client. And I don't, when I say personally applicable, isn't that, well, I think the client would do this, right? If you ever watch my nine fatal sales errors, one of the biggest fail errors is assuming, I think, I think this is how they're going to reinvest it. I think this is how they're going to spend their money. Stop it, right? You have to ask them. If we were able to save you, you know, 20%, how would this come back to us, right? How much time do you think that this potentially would save you? Now, we do need to understand how much, how often, um, how many, right? Those are quantifiables. How, how much time savings would this do? How often are you currently doing this process? Um, how many employees are currently involved in this, right? I mean, those are great quantifiables. But until we are able to take that information and then ask it back, well, when you are able to reduce your headcount, when you are able to uh, do it not, uh, you know, maybe uh, one less time a week, right? Um, when you are able to do it, you know, in this type of context, how would you go ahead and reapply that, that information? 
Now, it's not also about the time savings, you guys. We're at a point in our lives where we're not just looking for time savings. We're not just looking for money savings. If your client is only interested, if you ask them like, you know, how would this impact you? And they're like, well, we just need to save money. Your follow-up question should be, and how would you reinvest that save money? Why is it important for you to invest? Like, why is it important for you to save that money? If they keep saying, well, we just need to save, we just need to save, we need to save, I need you guys to stand strong, right? Hold yourself heavy and think to yourself, am I willing to get on this sinking ship? Any company that is going ahead and is only interested in saving, 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 savings without thinking about how I'm going to reinvest that savings is a sinking ship. And as a business owner, I, I urge you to tread with caution in this case, because if you go ahead and just jump into that, you're not going to be able to help your client grow and expand and achieve more. And that's ultimately what we want to do. Okay. So the questions we should be asking, right? If you, there's an old saying that if you, if you don't like the answer, you should have asked a better question, right? If you don't know where your client wants to get their, their return on investment, we, should, we need to ask them and we need to understand that better question. Questions allow ourselves to drive, um, to become the driver, right? We put ourselves in this application. So, um, so I mentioned you guys that I am, um, I love watching American politics. Um, it's, it's like incredibly interesting to me. And I, I wrote this one in here, you guys, because one of the candidates, um, their big question that they ask when they, when they canvass, um, people is what would you do with an extra $1,000 a month? Right. The reason why this question is so impactful, right? Think about this as, you know, essentially a buyer into votes, right? The reason why this, this question is so impactful is because it puts me in the driver's seat, right? It allows me to tell you what's important. Whereas if I was being a terrible salesperson, I would go ahead and say like, well, with a thousand dollars a month, you can go ahead and start a business or, you know, pay off student loans and everything. And I'm giving you a whole bunch of information and you're like, well, I don't have student loans. I have no interest in starting a business. I, you know, dot, 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 dot. And then you can think of all the reasons why you wouldn't actually want that, right? Or why that's not meaningful to you. Whereas when you turn it in the form of a question, right? Um, you know, you can go ahead and actually get the information back. In Charles's case, you know, you could go ahead and ask somebody, like, you know, what would it do? I'm, I'm actually just going to scroll back up here, you guys, so I can see, right? Um, you know, Shannon with management consulting, focusing on leadership, like, you know, how, how would having more effective leaders help you become more product? productive, right? How would that productivity translate into more revenue or more profitability? Um, you know, so Charles then says he's also in leadership and team development. How, how would you measure this? So I put in the second one, how would you measure the success of this project? How would we measure this? I get this question all the time. How, Kim, how will we know your sales training works? I'm like, that is a great question. How would you like to measure the success of this project? And then you do, you get the blank stares and they're like, oh, I have no idea, right? Well, can you give us some ideas? And I'm like, you know what? There's lots of different things that we can measure, right? Number one, if you don't measure it, it doesn't exist. And number two, whatever measurements we choose, we need to choose no more than two because then we don't want to try to look at all the measurements because then we don't know, is it causation or correlation? Is it happening because of the training or is it happening and out regardless whether the training was happening or not? And I will give them a couple suggestions on what we could measure, but it needs to be meaningful for them. The other thing I also like to ask is in the absence of that immediate result, how else will we know we're on the successful path? So when I work with people on sales training, right, the first thing is like, well, you know, how will we know this is successful for you? Well, Kim, we're just going to, we're going to see more revenue, of course, right? If we have better trained salespeople, we're going to see more revenue. Great, right? How, what are your current revenue goals that you measure right now? And then yet again, I get another blank stare. Uh, well, we, we get, uh, we, we measure, you know, just how much revenue. Okay, are you measuring it by rep? Are you measuring it by industry line? Are you measuring it by profitability? Like, what are we potentially measuring here? Oh, uh, well, I, you know, I don't really know. Okay, well, fair enough. And it, until, like, you know, in the absence of seeing immediate revenue growth, because we're talking about long-term sales cycles, 
How will we know we're on the right track? What is the measurement that we're going to watch in the interim to know that this is getting us closer to our goal? And I try to get the client to nail down two or three different things on what is meaningful to them. And I ask them, why is that, why is that particular metric or why is that particular ratio important? And how will that help you to get to bigger goals for yourself? How will knowing that or how will measuring that allow you to gain all these things? And when, when you're able to, you know, so let's say for instance, you know, a client is very interested in measuring some type of profitability regardless what type of industry we're talking about, right? Whether we're talking about automated environmental data or event management, um, you know, or just process improvement, right? Well, the only reason we're interested in pr improving our processes is because we need to become more profitable. Fantastic. Okay. So how are you, what are some of the profitability ratios that you're watching? Are you watching profitability per employee, per, um, per client? Are you watching profitability uh, per square footage? Like what is really important to you? And how will you getting this solution help you get closer to there? What is the bigger goal, right? How will working with this get you closer to that? Now, if the client comes back to you and says like, listen, that like, well, I have no idea, Matthew, like you're, you're the expert, you're supposed to come tell us. This is like, this is why we ask all these questions. Well, I'm so glad that like we're having this conversation. We're going to talk about this here in a second. I'm so glad we're having this conversation, but you need to ask the questions, continue to ask them, you know, and it was like, well, I don't really know. It's like, okay, well, great. But why did you choose that ratio then? Why is that particular ratio meaningful for you? How will that help you? You are in control of the sales cycle and it is your responsibility to ensure that you are the one asking the questions. The person that asks the questions owns the conversation. And if you allow your client to turn this back on you, well, what is my return on investment? How will I know this worked? What, um, what will I expect to receive in six months time? Now the client is taking over control. And, and there's nothing wrong with allowing our clients to take control sometimes. But if a client is asking you, it's like, for instance, a, you go to a doctor and you have all these questions for the doctor, right? And the doctor's like, you know, well, why do I have this rash? Like, how can I get rid of it and everything? And the question, dark, doctor starts like turning it back on you and says, well, you know, what do you think, right? Um, well, you tell me, what, what, what should I prescribe you? Um, well, you tell me, right? So, I mean, you're like, well, I know you're the expert, but like, you know, what, what, do, we need to, what do we need to achieve? You know, so we need to understand, you know, how that, sorry guys, that was a terrible example. I apologize. <laughs> I have better examples. I'm like, no, of course you would ask the doctor a ton of questions. <laughs> Let's try a different example here. Um, you know, if you're talking, let's say, let's say you're the buyer in this situation, right? Now I'm going ahead and I'm buying a software and I'm saying, okay, I want to buy this software. And the software company is like, okay, well, you know, how are you going to use it? You know, what are you wanting to see as an impact and everything? And then you're just like, well, I don't know. I don't know the answer. You tell me, you tell me how I'm supposed to use this software. You tell me um, how I would see improvements in my company. Why am I in this buying cycle? if I don't know where I want to get to? Why am I having this conversation if I have no vision for the future? And it is up to you to ask those questions and find out what that vision of the future looks like. The answers you get should still continue to lead us to collaboration. You guys, this is very important. We no longer work in a sales cycle where it is up to us to, number one, I mean, terrible salespeople still do this, right? And unfortunately, there are too many terrible people where they, they book a meeting with you. It's usually, you know, I'll book a meeting with you. I'm going to get online. I'm going to show you like, you know, um, a bunch of data dump stuff. I'm going to show you uh, what other people have achieved in the past, what I've done. I'm going to give you some type of presentation, a demo. And then I'm going to ask you, are you ready to buy or can, are you really to go into the next meeting. I had this opportunity uh, two weeks ago. Somebody we had been connecting on LinkedIn were like, oh, this is great. And I'm like, oh, I'm like this. Like, I've, I've actually heard of your company. I'm actually like really interested in, in purchasing your services and everything. She's like, oh, that's great. You know, we should really get on a call. And I said, awesome. And we have this call booked for literally 15 minutes. And in that period of time, um, she, we're, we're on the phone and she goes, can I share a screen with you? And I said, yeah, book me on a Zoom. So we get onto Zoom and the rest of like seven minutes is her like going through the software. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm just like, and she, she like went in so deep and so far. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I think that's actually overkill for what we need.
because we didn't, she didn't understand where I was going for it. Whereas if she would have asked the questions, understand where, where I wanted to get to, how this was going to help my, my entire process, how this was going to help become more profitable, gain more revenue, be able to engage with more clients. Now we can go ahead. And when we eventually get to the point where we're at presentation phase or proposal phase, you guys, this doesn't have to be a PowerPoint one person sided conversation. We are allowed to open up the document. We are allowed to go ahead and say, you know, is this meaningful for you? Is this enough for you? What else would we like? Remember, we're getting together with our client because we're a team now. We are a team. And the like, you know, the acronym for team is together everyone achieves more. This isn't just our clients achieving more and we are like achieving more because they're our clients, but rather how do we collaborate? How do we present our solutions? And when you do get to a solution presentation phase, remember we always present it from highest to lowest, not from lowest to highest. And the reason why is because, um, number one, Dan Pink wrote about this in his book, When, but the, the other reason behind this is because when you present solutions to people and you go from low to high, no matter what, everyone gets sticker shock the moment they see the price. Oh, oh my God, no, this is so much money. Even if we've completely set their expectations. Oh, I thought it was going to be easier. Whereas if you anchor them, um, so, and sorry, now you go on, like, they're going to get sticker shock no matter what. You go from low and then you're like, okay, now I have sticker shock. And then it's like, okay, but here's even more. You're like, oh, I don't feel comfortable. And here's even more. It's like, oh, I don't feel comfortable. Imagine giving somebody and letting them know, I'm going to give you a 50 pound weight. And then you give them that 50 pound weight and they're like, okay, okay. And then you're just like, oh, now I'm going to throw in another 10 pounds. I'm going to throw in another 20 pounds. The person's going to like, you know, end up like falling over because of all this weight. Whereas if you give them the, the big pounds first, right? And you're like, listen, I'm going to give you 80 pounds right now, right? And you give them 80 pounds and then you lift off the first 20 and like, oh, I feel lighter. And then you lift off the, the next 10, like, oh, I feel even lighter. Like that feels really good. So get them to a point where they're emotionally charged. And we talk about emotions later on in another presentation all the way through. But when you do present your price, you, that return on investment piece, those are your ands. We present the price and, 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 and lifts us up. The moment we get to price, we, we will shut off no matter what, right? You know, I'm shut off. Like I'm just, I need to like just absorb this. But the nice thing is, is the moment we start to, we continuously hear the ands, ands, ands. It's like there's a soothing nature to it, right? And this is going to help you improve your efficiency in this particular process. And one of the reasons why you said that was so important is because you wanted to redeploy some of your resources. And that was going to allow you to ultimately gain more clients and allow you to get, gain more revenue. And, 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 and then when you eventually get to close, then you say, and how does that sound? We're ultimately asking them, how does all of these and sound? Not how does the price sound? And too many people will say, here's the price. And then they're like, you know, and there's a big thing to like, you know, when you go to ask the close, you shut up, but you don't have to present the price and then shut up because it's like, here's the price. What do you think? You're like, oh. Uh, I, I feel uncomfortable right now. So don't leave your clients feeling uncomfortable. Soothe them with the ands. Hand them like this heavy weight and each and is like a life jacket that you're giving them, a life preserver. You're lifting them up. You're making them feel more comfortable and weightless as you're going through there. <sighs> How was that, you guys? Right? We talked a lot about return on investment and I do have time for questions. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit more about our programs as well. Nabil, who has a software company, he says he really felt like he, we underpriced our program for all the value he received. We go in like really deep. Our classes are 90 minutes long and we have uh, students just like you. Rob Crooks, he says, the longer you wait, that's revenue you're missing out on. <gasps> oh, you guys, we don't want you to miss out on revenue, right? This is ultimately about taking those conversations that you're already having them and maximizing the dollars and helping you start even brand new conversations with the top tier clients, the ones that understand value. Cameron, he went through our entire program, an engineer. If you guys ever believe, we talk a lot about emotional intelligence as well throughout the entire sales cycle and how it fits in the sales process. Engineer, um, Cameron told me that engineers don't have feelings. And as he started to apply this, he's like, oh my goodness, Kim, this was like magic or something. Like he's like, I all of a sudden I was moving these sales cycles from like, and they would feel like a five or six. He's like to a nine or 10, like they were ready to close. He's like, I don't know what you did. There was like some magic pill that you've included in there. 
So we do have small classroom sizes. We have some upcoming classes coming up. The coolest things are you guys, you get access for life to all of our content. We're not here just to teach you a bunch of course and then like send you on your way. We're constantly updating our program and we're allowing you to get guaranteed, guaranteed results. I'm going to put my, this is actually my booking link right in here. I'm going to just type it in here. So it's an easy click for you here. There you go. Um, you can go ahead and book some time with me, right? Let's just understand a little bit more, but guaranteed results. What does that mean? If you take the program and for whatever reason you've applied all of the information and you haven't seen your, your investment come back to you. Number one, I will work with you for up to three months until it happens We're free of charge. I, I charge a ridiculous amount um, to work with me, but I'm going to give that to you. And if after three months, you still like you, you've taken the program, you've worked with my instructors, you've worked with me and you still have not got your money back. You guys, we put it right in our agreement, triple your money, back. We call it our $15,000 guarantee. You get $15,000 and no questions asked. We failed you. I'm sorry, but your time is worth something. And we want to make sure you are fairly compensated for all of that. So we have two, uh, two upcoming classes. You can graduate in, a oh, sorry, it, should, it shouldn't say April. It should say May. You can graduate in May. You could be a KO sales. You graduate. Um, we start at the end of this month. With, you can also graduate in June. So you can go ahead and have everything you need so that when everyone else is in summer slowdown, you're crushing it. You're like, what slowdown? I am busier than I've ever been in my life. And that one starts in March, you guys. We also have our self-study program. So if, you know, whatever reason you're like, you know what, I just want to see if I can make this work on my own. Right. You can get access to all of the content that we teach minus the instructions available. You get lifetime access to that as well. Um, we have a 60 day guaranteed, no questions asked type of thing, right? So that you can either, if you take the first classes and you're like, you know what, I'm not really sure. I would actually prefer to work with an instructor. Whatever you've invested, we will apply it towards one of the upcoming KO sales do classrooms or if you take 60 days, you get up to week six in content. We're going to give you week six out of 10. If you get more than halfway through the content and you have not, for whatever reason, you just like, you know what? This is just, this is terrible, right? I, I'm doing the work. I'm watching the videos. I'm doing the assignments and everything. I just, I'm just unsatisfied. You guys, right? We'll give you your money back. Right now. I hope you come back to us and tell us why you're unsatisfied because we're constantly trying to make things better, but listen, I don't want you to feel like, you know, you're not getting what you deserve out of this. Our next webinar is coming up on Monday, March 2nd. Let me just double check. Second, seven surefire ways to sell more faster. For those of you guys that have seen my, my classic one, nine fatal errors sales market leaders don't make this this one I'm so excited to because this is the, the updated, not the updated version. I don't want to say this is like part two. So everything we don't cover nine fatal sales errors that are still like those pressing questions. Oh my goodness. We have another seven. We have seven hard hitting things that you can take away right now. We end every classroom with this question, you guys, because you're, you're unofficial students of our class. But what is one thing that you are going to take away with today? All right, go ahead, feel free. If you're feeling open to it, write it in the, the chat box. What, it, what did you take away from today? I am available to you guys for another five more minutes. And if you have any questions, please, this is your time. I appreciate you. I know that there's a lot of things that you have to do on a Monday morning. And I thank you so much for choosing to spend this time with me and helping you grow your business. I am here for you and I want to help you grow and expand as much as possible because things become a lot easier and more fun when we're able to create more connection, more conversations and more client opportunities. Shannon. Yeah. She says, you know, her takeaway is to have them create an ROA. Yeah. Shannon, let them articulate to do the nice thing about having them tell you the ROI is if, if you can't achieve it, or if, you, if they're so ridiculous, number one, you help to set their expectations before you get to the closing stage or number two, you get to smile and nod and be like, yeah, like that's great. I'm glad your expectations are there because I can definitely help you get there. 
and then you, you're able to create this collaboration. Charles, don't ever tell them what it is, right? Allow them to it and then they will own it. <gasps> Charles, that's such a good takeaway. You're absolutely right. You know, and then they, and then they're now responsible for it. Like they have, well, there, there's a saying called skin in the game, right? Now they essentially have skin in the game because they're like, this is what I have told you is most important to me. This is how we will measure our success. And you can create a dashboard or you can help them create and monitor that, measure that level of success. You could also, if you're wanting to have a lot of fun, you could even create like little gamifications, right? Or like, you know, when the client does achieve that level, now you have a reason to celebrate as their, as their high value service provider. Listen, this is how you wanted to measure it. This is what we achieved and we achieved it in four months instead of the six months we thought we were going to. Hey, you know, here's something fun that you get to celebrate with on that. Um, can I put the sales slide back up, please? Yes, I can, Shannon. Sorry, you guys, I don't want you to get too dizzy. There it is, right? The sales cycle slide. Um, yeah, go ahead, take a screenshot or whatever else you want. Um, when you're part of the course, we actually have this as a really cool, beautiful laminated piece um, that actually gets mailed to you as part of your welcome package. And we have students that will leave that, you know, at their desk so that it is a great visual for them to see every single time they're in the sales cycle. So they're like, okay, now I, I know where my client is. Um, so the, the, the cool notice on this is the, the bold portion is where you are as a sales cycle. You can also rename in your CRM these stages um, so that you know. The italics is where is your buyer in this point in time. You know where you are because your buyer is in that point. And then the other portion but just beneath that is what is the outcome that you need to achieve? What are you trying to achieve at that sales cycle, right? So whether it's open ended questions, asking how does that feel, um, give and take negotiations, or just you know ensuring that you have um, continuity in continuing the sales cycle all the way. Awesome, you guys. Was this valuable? Did you like that? Hopefully. <laughs> You guys are all so quiet, right? Everyone's like, oh, Kim, there's not enough coffee in the world on this Monday morning. Oh, thank you, Matthew. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. I'm here for you guys. So yeah, if nobody has any further questions, I'll, I'll, I'll stay on for another two more minutes. But if not, you guys, thank you. Thank you for spending this time with me. I hope to see you all in a month or so and where we will talk about um, the seven surefire ways to sell more faster. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I appreciate you as well. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate you. Matthew, I appreciate you. And Michael, I appreciate you. So thank you all so much for, for being a part of this. Oh, the meeting link. Let's just see. <laughs> We're going to see if it works here. I might have, maybe I put it in wrong. Oh, thanks, Matthew. I appreciate that. Okay, so if for whatever reason it's not coming up for you like this, um, and it looks like it's still kind of a little bit delayed, uh, you can go ahead and even just send me, um, send me an email. Uh, I'm doing, um, I'm doing a couple lunch and learns, or like I'm in a bunch of meetings and everything today. What I'll do is if you send me that email, I'm going to forward it on immediately to uh, Caitlin. Um, she is my, uh, my executive assistant um, and she will connect with you uh, right away and get you a time booked in my calendar if that's easier for you. And, um, and so, yes, I'm happy, more than happy to, um, oh, sorry, I put it privately, but I'll put it to everyone here, you guys. It's Kim at KimOrleski.com is my email address. Cool. You're welcome. Awesome. Bye-bye.